You're listening to Building the Broncos with Nick Kendall and Carl Dummler, Broncos Country's leading draft and scouting analysts. Get on over to milehighhuddle.com to sound off on all things Broncos. All right, everyone, we're uh, getting into the show here in just a second. We're waiting for Facebook to kind of pull up and get the thumbs up. We got the thumbs up, so welcome into Building the Broncos. I am your host, Carl Dumbler. Of course, joining me from Seattle is Mr. Nick Kendall. How are you, buddy? Hey, I'm doing pretty well. It's, uh, man, already Tuesday night, so happy belated Martin Luther King Day, everybody. It's good to start the week off on a, on a Tuesday and already hump day tomorrow, so really excited and excited to be here, talk some more Denver Broncos, and obviously there's some directions heading uh, with the team, so we kind of starting to get an idea of what this team start to look like, so I'm excited. Yeah, I got, got to hear from Mr. George Peyton, you did whatever. I can't, I can't remember. No, Patrick, no. Or Patrick, yeah, George Patrick. Patrick, Patrick George gave me Elway. It's better than Case Keesum. <laughs> yeah, or uh, I'd like to thank John Elway. <laughs> but uh, uh, no, yeah, so it's good to hear from him. I thought he did great for his first time being in front of the media. And uh, I'm excited to dig into especially some of his thoughts on the uh, the, the draft. Because Vikings have some – they've been one of the, the more – I don't know, not aggressive, but one of the more active teams in all of the NFL when it comes to the draft. So Peyton today, obviously he had his big press conference, his introductory press conference. And, you know, it's weird because of, again, as your daughter likes to say, the sick little bug uh, that's going around. It was still virtual, but it was good to hear everybody talk. Joe Ellis, Vic Fangio, John Elway, and of course, George Peyton. Uh, I mean, how much can you really take away from the introductory press conference? You know, it's always kind of talking in platitudes and, you know, oh, yeah, everybody loves me. He's going to be great. He, he had the best interview of all time. I love the direction this team's going to be. I know it's kind of unfortunate. You don't really know until you know, though. You know, it's just you have to let time play out. It's kind of a not to be too much of an epidemiologic nerd here, but it's kind of a longitudinal stu- longitudinal study. You know, you just have to have a lo- enough time pass before you can look back and really analyze it. So, we don't know, but uh, it seems like everybody in Dove Valley is pretty excited about it, and that makes me excited because, I mean, yeah. you have the choice to be optimistic about it. Why wouldn't you be? Yeah, and I, I did like that there were, were some things I, – I don't know. I think there's there's been too many loose lips in Denver, and from what I understand, one of Peyton's big things that he wants to implement is kind of getting some things squelched down because, I mean, he, even on here, we've known for the most part down to about two or three guys for the first round – who the Broncos were looking at, who they were going to take. Yeah. Because I mean, people, people like to talk and uh, LA <laughs> at times like to talk. Uh, so uh, I, I did appreciate there were times when they were like, Hey, you know, when you're looking at drew Locke for the future, do you think you can win with them? He's like, I'm not going to comment on that. I mean, th- th- that's just putting the squelch right there. Like, Hey, we're not letting you know right now where this is going. Yeah, I mean, he kind of like a lot of people, there's a lot of projecting of what the team's going to do specifically around surrounding the quarterback position, but also the first round draft pick just in general, the philosophy of the team and Peyton's came out today. Obviously, they talked about stuff in the interview process. You know, what are your ideas? What are some directions of the team? What do you think of the roster so far? And he talked about the young core, specifically the young offensive core multiple times. But then he said, you know, I haven't even really sat down the virtual, but sat down with these coaches and the scouts and the people in college personnel to really even start to formulate that plan because he's right. very much emphasizing a, it's a community aspect. You know, it's not a, yep. uh, a, th- a th- yeah, authoritative regime. You know, yep. it's not like Jerry Jones down there where, you know, I, I, I'm making all the calls here. So he wants to make sure it's not a John. He said, not a John Elway decision, not a Vic Fangio decision, not a George Payton decision, but a Broncos decision. So, I mean, anybody, obviously things can change quickly. The information that we have right now, I would assume is probably coming from John Elway or Joe Ellis or somebody connected to them specifically. But I, I would imagine that's going to change rapidly. And it's that time of year in general, but specifically with a new guy coming in, George Payton, yeah. he hasn't even met these guys. They're going to have different ideas and the direction of this team is going to start to take shape. But, you know, don't, don't talk in absolutes. Don't assume anything in absolutes. You see something on Twitter or Facebook that's, oh, this is how it's going to be. Pump the brakes. Things can change quickly. I mean, <laughs> right. I think we all remember Cliff Kingsbury when he was hired, like, oh, Josh Rosen's our quarterback. Yeah, that lasted about a month. So, you know, things things will change. That's just yes. the nature of it. You're right. Exactly. I mean, you get to watch more film, not only on Drew Locke, but maybe this draft class. I'm guessing they're going to probably watch some of the 2022 class as well. 
and kind of make a decision. You, this is something you need to understand when you're talking about team building. It's not just about what you see for this year that the team needs, but it's what you see for two, three, four years down the road. Because you, you and I have talked about it how many times on here. You are drafting not for guys for their rookie season, but what they do years two through four. Because yeah. the, the odds of a rookie coming in and being a Pro Bowl player, pretty slim. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm trying to think this this last season. Chase Young, who went number two overall. Did Herbert get a Pro Bowl? I don't even I remember. remember. I mean, Pro Bowl is kind of a hard measure stick because that, true. they don't really have the exposure. Right. Uh, but, but I'm, yeah. I'm thinking of guys that really made – I mean, Justin Jefferson made a huge impact for for the yeah. Vikings, if we're, we're talking about them. Uh, but for the most Winfield part, rookies really – Who? Winfield. Yep. For Tampa. Yep, that's another good one. I mean, but again, those are the exception, not the rule. You think about how many guys are drafted – how many actually come in and are huge playmakers day one in the NFL? It, it's pretty slim. So like I said, you're looking for guys for years two through four, and uh, that's where the Broncos are going to be looking. Of what, what can we get from guys this year? What are we looking at for 2022 and beyond? Oh, Werfs was another one. That oh, was yes, Werfs. Good so, choice. Uh, how dare you? My, my number three player last year on the board, on my final board. So uh, if the Broncos would have lost to the Raiders week 17, which, you know, whatever, can't do it. But, man, it would have been nice to have Tristan Werfs. Jerry Judy's a fine, fine consolation prize, but Worfs looks like a future Hall of Famer. So, yep. oh, well, what can you do? Oh, well, and speaking of the Hall of Fame, we have Kenneth Booker asking the question, do you think do you think the Hall of Fame is a popularity contest? So, um, it's not necessarily a popularity contest, but it is somewhat. I mean, they tend to lean towards teams that have more popularity, uh, teams that are you know, have been in the Super Bowl, made runs, et cetera, et cetera. And also guys who have played buddy, buddy with football writers or have been in the media. I mean, you know, Steve Atwater, he definitely deserved to be in the Hall of Fame, but it was not uncoordinated that he was more and more in the media accessing these writers who are voting on it. You know, that's not right. by accident. Like anybody would tell you that's by accident, then, you know, like <laughs> they're, they're selling you something else. Uh, right. But it's kind of like, uh, it's definitely a part of a popularity contest. But right. I, I think of like Terrell Owens. He should have been first ballot, but yeah, media, but- he did not like media. Media did not like him. And so when those are the people who are voting on you, <laughs> it, it's kind of like the don't bite the hand that feeds you. Uh, Absolutely. So that, that's kind of the thing that shows up. And, and yeah, the Broncos are a small market. Now they have a big fan base. It's gotten bigger, but you, you think about over the years, really football, when it was more regional, before it became its global brand that it is today, uh, because you're thinking about some of those old school guys, they just weren't as well known because you had bigger markets on the East coast or West coast with San Francisco, uh, the Raiders, all those kind of things. The Broncos just kind of got left in the dust on some of that. And they've tried to play some catch up over the last few years with some of the Broncos, but it's still, obviously they're, they're not as represented as they should be considering how many Super Bowls they've been involved in and how many greats they've had come through that organization. Yeah, I mean, there's teams that probably have guys in that probably aren't as deserving as some who are left out. I mean, you think about the 49ers, the Cowboys, the Steelers, uh, maybe even some of those New York teams. But, you know, it's it's not a fair world also. So uh, what can you do? Hopefully there'll be some more Broncos in there uh, as time goes on. So we got – John was waving away for that one. Carl, calm down. My bad. My bad. Um, But, yeah, no, it's – it'll definitely be interesting to see what happens with uh, the hall of fame. And I mean, obviously the big thing is like first ballot, right? Like that's also, it's not just getting in the hall of fame, but the first ballot guys as well. So uh, got Peyton Manning coming up here. Champ Bailey was a first ballot hall of famer. Troll Davis eventually got in. Steve Atwater eventually got in. Pat Bolin eventually got in. So the Broncos are starting to really make a push in the, the hall of fame front. So, you know, can't really say that. Uh, I wouldn't really say that it's unfair to the Broncos. Right. All right, and we also want to let you know that tonight's live stream podcast is brought to you by sportsbetting.com. Broncos country, gambling is, of course, legal in the state of Colorado, and you're looking to to make watching your favorite sports a little more interesting. Head on over to sportsbetting.com for a your, your no-brainer destination. Here's why. They have sharp odds and low juice. They have in-house bookmakers, and they're not a third-party provider of odds. They have reduced juice and best prices. They also have hassle-free bonuses with a one-time rollover, meaning the bonus money is yours after you bet it one time. Some other sites, it takes five to 30 times. 
They also have 24 seven live customer uh, support. Always a real person in the U S here's the kicker right now. After you make your first deposit, sportsbetting.com will match it up to $750. That's $750 in free bet credits. Plus right now with the NBA season to set the tip off, you'll also get $25 in free bet credits. So head on over to sportsbetting.com forward slash mile high huddle. That's sportsbetting.com forward slash mile high huddle and capitalize on up to $750 in free bet credits and start 2021 off on the right foot and make sure that you're following us on Twitter. You can find me at Carl Dumbler MHH and Nick at Nick Kindle MHH. And if you're joining us via YouTube, do us a huge favor and like subscribe and share our show. And on Facebook, make sure you click those little thumbs up. Also, don't miss out on all of our great in-season content at milehighhuddle.com. We are getting into all the draft and free agency and and Von Miller and Justin Simmons issues. So make sure you head on over there. You're going to find lots of great stuff as we are an affiliate of the Sports Illustrated part of Fan Nation brought to you by Overtime Media. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. We got to say thank you to tonight's presenting sponsor, Manscaped. Gang, 2020 was tough. It was it sucked. I think a lot of a lot of men out there kind of let themselves go with regard to manscaping. But it's 2021. It's a new year, and the good news is the time is right for you to to get started on upping your game, stepping your game up with regard to manscaping. And right now, Zach, I know it's uh, you know I think most people are trying to most dudes out there are in the spirit. I know we're about almost three weeks into into the new year, but Zach, I think they're for the most part, still in the spirit of new year, new me, and what 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 better way to, to symbolize that than Manscaped? Yeah, you have the lawnmower, chat. I actually have the weed whacker. I love showing off. And I was using this the other day, and I was thinking to myself, I once had a nose hair trimmer. I won't mention any names or brands that when I put it inside my nose and I used it, it would be grabby, and I would actually cause some discomfort inside my nose and, and cause a little irritation there. When I use this, there's no irritation. There's no discomfort. It's a seamless process. Gets all the nasty stuff out, makes you look good, makes you feel better. And when you feel better, you act better, Chad. Like the old Deion Sanders expression about you know, feeling good, playing good. When you feel good as a human being, you tend to um, exert that you know, outside of your, of your realm as well. And you get to uh, walk around with a better sense of confidence. And that's what Manscaped allows you to do. I recommend this highly, guys. You will not be disappointed. Yeah, so back at the topic at hand, uh, George Payton, not George Patrick Elway, George Payton uh, coming in here today and obviously had an illuminating press conference overall. And the thing we got to talk about here is probably that quarterback decision or quarterback talking points. You know, he talked about Drew Locke. He talked about uh, being aggressive and building through the draft. And I just want to know what your general thoughts are after watching Payton in the press conference about the quarterback position, because let's face it, that's going to be on everybody's tongues, everybody's minds, Intel kickoff next year. I mean, until the draft comes to pass, we'll probably still be talking about that. So right. it's going to be I, <laughs> here to stay. Right. I, I would say just from hearing his words, it doesn't seem like they're going to be big time pushers in the, the Sean Watson sweepstakes. They, he kept talking about not taking any shortcuts, trading big time capital to go get Deshaun Watson. Well, I, I still think it's a really good idea because if you don't have a, uh, all-star quarterback, especially in the AFC West, you're not going to stand a chance. It doesn't sound like that's the way he wants to go about building this team. Not saying it won't happen. Maybe they get in there and the trade isn't as big as they thought it was going to be. Maybe uh, he really wants to come to Denver and the Broncos are like, Hey, you want to come to Denver? Come on down. Yeah. We'll we'll kind of see on some of that, but I I just, I feel like they're kind of leaning a different direction that it's either going to be drew lock draft pick or a veteran free agent coming in that isn't all that expensive. I think the veteran free agent is probably going to happen no matter what they do in the draft. That's you have to set yourself up to not be desperate for a quarterback in the draft. Not that they would be because Locke shows that he can play in the league. Now to what extent we're fixing to find out, but you know that they would probably still bring in some sort of hedge independent of the draft. That just gives you more options and also keeping the cards closer to the vest when you get to the draft, which is probably going to be important for the Broncos picking at nine. So yeah, I I think that is independent and I will push back a little bit. I mean, it does seem like, you know, talking about building through the draft over time, maybe taking a step back to take steps forward. But then at the same time, he said, we're going to explore every trade. And if there's something there, we're going to be aggressive. So you have a 25 year old top five quarterback potentially available. They would, I mean, honestly, he would already fail his, job as a general manager if they didn't call 
or at yeah. least show interest because Deshaun Watson is that caliber of a quarterback that could lead you for the next 10 to 15 years. And I was doing the math, you know, talking, it's so hard to even picture because the Broncos have been shuffling quarterbacks so much, but you imagine Deshaun Watson, the Broncos bring in Deshaun Watson. You have him for the next 15 years at quarterback. Do you know how far back who does the court 15 years forward? Imagine 15 years back. Who was the Broncos starting quarterback? 15, so that'd be 2006, 2005. It was the year the Broncos went to the AFC oh, Championship That was game. Jake Plummer. Yeah. Jake Plummer. Now imagine having a franchise quarterback for that duration of time. I mean, right. it's even hard. People, I don't think people appreciate the scope of what having that good of a quarterback that young could do for a team. You're in it right. every single year. Even if right. you're losing draft capital, you have you raise the floor. So right. I mean, and, you have and, to think about it. And, and here's what I point to with, with the draft itself. You think about the 2013 to 2016, you, you have Sly Williams, then you have uh, Bradley Roby, then you have Shane Ray, then you have Paxton Lynch. So if you're giving up four first-round picks, that's the possibility that you have if you decide we're going to take the risk and go with the draft picks. Yeah. All four of those guys are – Bradley Roby is an average cornerback. That's the best guy of the group. That, that's yep. it. <laughs> and, and so when, when you're talking about what you might be giving up, and I know some people then point to the next window where you have like Bradley Chubb, Garrett Bowles. And I mean, it is, it's a risk, but at the same time to me, uh, those who keep saying the Broncos can't fill their holes on their team. One, the draft is bigger than the first round. If you listen to this show, Please make sure that you know you are that there there is more than than one round. Really, the the bulk of the roster are not first round picks. About probably ninety percent of your roster are not first round picks. Yeah. So you you need to understand that as long as the Broncos can keep decent capital, when when we're talking about second through seventh round picks or even un, undrafted guys, and then you just got to be smart with your free agent bring ins. Uh, you can make it work. You you can still have a strong team around him, and and give up the draft capital. And, and I would say I want that, to point push back at this, this thing about the Broncos have too many holes. You know what teams have an ungodly amount of holes? If you look at it each position by position, the Packers and the Chiefs. They have the offensive line for the Chiefs is dreadful. Their linebackers are terrible. Their cornerback depth is bad. Doesn't freaking matter. Because Patrick Mahomes is that good. The Packers, they lost the best left tackle in football. Their wide receivers outside of Devontae Adams, not good. They have uh, they found a tight end from nowhere. Uh, some questions about the, the defense still, the depth of the defense, defensive line. Doesn't matter. You have a top five quarterback. So, uh, you know, holes, you're always going to have holes. That's the nature of a football team. If you have a perfect roster, then, you know, by, by all means, that's great. You know, whatever. But that's so hard to do, especially with you only have so much capital. It's a limited capital and right. draft picks and guys under contract at the same time. Injuries happen. If you have a quarterback, they're essentially, you know, the boy in the dam, you know, holding the, the leaky dam. Yeah. Except they have like they're using their fingers and toes because they can cover that many holes. Right. Uh, so, I mean, if you have a chance at it, you have to at least talk about the possibility. Now, there is some point right. like can the Broncos match a deal? Let's say he would accept a deal with the Jets or the Dolphins Broncos would have a hard time matching the capital that the Dolphins or Jets could give just because not only do those teams pick two and three, they also have another first round pick this year. And I'm guessing right. whoever the Houston is, is not, I mean, how much more valuable is a 2024 first or less valuable as a 2024 first round pick compared to a mid to late first round pick this year. I mean, then those guys don't even know if they're going to be there by then. So that's a big thing you have to think about as well, but you have to talk about, it. I think this, I think the Broncos PR, which, you know, whatever they peddled this, BS narrative where you have to have this perfect roster to compete when really, if you have a quarterback of that caliber, you have a chance every year. And I know that yep. it's like, Oh, the Texans finished whatever this year, as long as you don't have freaking bill O'Brien making decisions and just setting <laughs> your team on fire. You're talking about also setting, uh, doing draft or trade decisions where Peyton coming in more of a forward thinking view, not bill O'Brien. That's why almost always outside of bill Belichick, a coach being the general manager and coach, almost always ends in tears because they just cannot separate the short term I have to succeed to protect well, that, my job versus the long-term outlook. Well, it's, it's two full-time jobs. When I say full-time NFL is like from sun up to sundown during the season. And then general manager, it's from like four in the morning until midnight during the off season. 
yeah. doing things. So he did talk how much he likes to grind. Peyton, he's all about you know. The, I, the hard yeah, work. and, and I, I really, that. I like that. I like that he he sees that in himself and and wanting to. He loves football. That's that's yeah. a great thing to see. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. <laughs> But kind of getting into to Black Knight's question here. So what would Stafford cost in terms of trade capital? That kind of brings us then to Mr. Boggan's Super Chat. Uh, first round, Marshawn Latimer. Second round, Stafford. Plus lose a receiver in trade. Third, Cameron McGrone. Love me some McGrone. That's my day two linebacker of choice. I know he was injured this year, but and Michigan didn't play very many games, but I really like McGrone. There's a lot of guys on that Michigan team that I feel like a little bit underrated. Yeah. Uh, the right tackle they have too, uh, Jalen Mayfield. I don't feel like people are talking about it. He was great this year. So yeah. anyway, um, <laughs> you're not getting Stafford for a second. I don't know where this is coming from. I, yeah. I Can you imagine, like, I think you have to at least give something equivalent to the Patriots at 15, right? Like the Patriots would easily throw 15 overall to get Matt Stafford for yeah. their window. I just, I, I just, I don't see how Matt Stafford comes with a second. And I don't think the Broncos should give nine for Stafford because, while Deshaun Watson gives you a window for 10 to 15 years and is a top five quarterback, Stafford's in that like 10 to 15 range. You can maybe argue eight, but I would say 10 to 15. Yeah. And does Stafford take you to the Chiefs? I I don't think so. Even though you just talked about the argument for elite quarterback plugging holes, he can plug some holes. You're definitely better offensively. Right. I just don't know out of the value of a first round pick. Right. And Latimer for pick number nine. I, I'm, I, I'd want to trade back a little bit. I'm not sure that he's worth quite pick nine since you're going to have to give him a big, big contract here in just one year or I even don't this I year. Be, I don't know if I can be unbiased because I loved, I was one of the first people on Latimer. I'm like watching Ohio State. Like, this kid is incredible. Yep. You see how long and much, how smooth he is and how physical he is. Like this kid is a number one cornerback in any draft. And yep. I at Martin Latimer as a prospect, I would take over easily. I would take over Sertan. Um, he has fairly has a lot of question marks, but I think fairly ceiling is Marshawn Lattimore, you know, like best yeah. case scenario for fairly is he turns out to be Marshawn Lattimore. Right. And then JC Horn, right. I think is a little, little grabby. So I get the argument for the contract, but if you're already using the ninth overall pick and on a cornerback, I consider, I mean, it's not like you have a seven, eight year window of a cornerback one there because he's only 24 years old. So right. I, I would consider it. I, yeah. I, and it's just because the saints are in such a bad situation. Like <laughs> Jalen Ramsey got two first round picks. Now Ramsey's better, but he's more of a headache. But Lattimore has been pretty darn good. In top five, top ten cornerback, twenty four years old. I, I would have to consider it. Yeah, I'm, It'd be I'm easier with if you. you had the quarterback in place. But yeah, right. I mean that that's part of it for me. Um, but it, it's not completely out of there. And then McGrone in the third round. So I, I did a little bit of research, looking at the the Vikings and what they've done draft wise over since since two thousand eleven. And kind of an interesting thing, they don't like the third round. That Maybe most of the, <laughs> they they like to trade out of the third round or trade back in the third round. That that's where they do a lot of their draft day trades, where they like to pick up extra picks. Uh, and so it, that that's something to kind of keep in mind looking for the Broncos and what they might do there in the third round. There's a good chance they might try to trade back to get a few extra picks, kind of like he talked about, where he likes to have as many darts to throw at the dartboard and hope that he can hit the target. Yeah, and that's something just do. I mean, we saw the combine was officially canceled. We're not sure what pro days are going to look like. The Senior Bowl and the Shrine Game are still happening, and the Broncos will be at the Shrine Game. So that gives them a little bit of a leg up and maybe more reason to trade back in that third round to day three because a lot of those Shrine guys are day three, late day three, undrafted free agent types of guys. So, I mean, you're going to have a better understanding of what makes those guys tick more so than almost any other team. And Peyton said multiple times today, you know, everybody's got to leap even playing field. But – Maybe not so much the case with the Broncos this year, just because they are working uh, the Shrine Bowl. Yep. All right. Brandon Reagan coming in here. We stay at nine. First pick, Caleb Farley. Size, range, zone ability. Tackling could be a bigger Champ Bailey. Uh, I'd say pump the brakes just a little because Champ Bailey's Hall of Fame, top three cornerback in NFL history, in my opinion. Uh, but, but, I mean, when you're looking at, yes, the height, weight, c- speed, aspect of what he brings to the table it's going to be hard to find a cornerback that brings more than farley i mean that, that's he he's just he's a freak he's been on that, that guy's freak list for two years because at that size he's running a, a four three forty. yeah i mean he's also pretty smart uh he played quarterback in high school as well uh came to virginia tech as 
you know, then recruiting. I'm not really into recruiting because I'm an Iowa Hawkeye fan, so that's never as fun. Uh, although they do better recently. But anyway, beside the point, we had to get my Iowa Hawkeye take in here. Everybody take a drink, whatever the heck you do when I mention the Hawks. Uh, but yes, no, fairly quarterback, wide receiver, and now cornerback. Uh, Champ Bailey, though, the thing about Champ Bailey is he was such a good tackler and he took amazing angle, angles. I mean, he was a safety playing cornerback as far as his tackling and angle skills and run gap, uh, run filling skills. Fairly, while I love the recognition in zone and the ball skills, the length and athleticism, those are all there. Tackling, angles to the football, those are all major question marks. And, they, they, you know, so you say Champ Bailey, I say, well, if he doesn't figure that out, could be a Dominique Rogers Camardi. And Dominic Rogers Camardi was great for a while, you know, really good athlete long, but just never really figured out the physical part of the game. And those are questions that we would have probably had a better answer on if he would have played this year. Didn't happen. That said, scheme fit is such a big thing with this Vic Fangio defense. I just don't see it with Sertan. I don't think he's a scheme fit. I don't think he's twitchy enough. I think he's too stiff. I think he's a cover three or press man guy. Uh, he'd be great in Dallas. And it doesn't mean that Sertan might go on to be the best cornerback in this draft. I just don't think he's a scheme fit. That's really That really matters for, for this uh this kind of thing. So we'll see. I really do like fairly though. And he's probably my number one hope at nine. If the Broncos are going cornerback. Yep. All right. Base gaze coming in here. Got the vibe. He isn't sold on lock. Seemed like he was gushing over Simmons. I think Peyton will lock him up to a huge deal. Uh, one, it's a lot easier to gush over Simmons. Just, I mean, the guy's a proven commodity in the NFL. He, he's two time all pro or second team all pro. He, he's just, he's been a star at the safety position. He's been a star in the community, a star in the locker room. I mean, the, he's a star everywhere he goes. The guy just shines bright, uh, shines bright like a diamond. Oh, Carl. I had to, I had, I'm sorry. It had to come out. Uh, but uh, no, he, it's easier to, to kind of gush over that, that situation. And I really do think good chance they're going to lock him up. I think all of the guys, from what I understand, from people we've talked to every single person that was interviewed for the GM job said, we have to get Simmons signed. Yeah. Or at least they said, we're going to push hard to get Simmons signed because they, they like him that much. Um, now drew lock. Yeah. I, I mean, and it doesn't sound like he's fully watched the tape. So I don't think he can really say one way or the other of how he feels. He's I think basing it on tell- his, his college profile what he because right. the vikings did work on him and then obviously they do it work on most quarterbacks every year right. that's his uh basis right now because the broncos haven't played the vikings in the past few years so right he, he doesn't and, really have an idea and and i would say it's you I, I would say i'd read more into what vic fangio said and what john elway said and the fact that i mean john elway is still gushing about drew lock it's easy to see that he was drew lock's biggest fan in the building and vic fangio not as sold on Drew Locke. Yeah, he was really, he when they asked about it, and this is great for Vic, I think Vic, say what you will, he's probably a little bit rough, you know, in general, but he talked about uh, he's not going to really push anything on Peyton for evaluating Locke because he doesn't want any sort of bias or preconceived notion to cloud Peyton's judgment when he goes and analyzes him. So, you know, read what you will there, but that's probably the best process you could possibly have. You want somebody coming in with outside eyeballs saying, you know, this is a mistake. And he, Fangio went on about it saying, you know, he can obviously, Peyton can come ask us about specifics about why he did this or whatever. Was it something that you were emphasizing in the scheme or the game plan that, you know, didn't really make sense to your eye? Uh, but still, you know, having somebody who's untethered from the previous regime to put this new scope on lock, I think is a, is a good decision. I mean, it's, yep. it's the way that any new GM should come in. If they were saying, you know, you're coming in and you are married to this guy after the up and downs of lock so far. Uh, that that might have been enough that Peyton's not even here, you know, like that right. kind of thing. So it'll be right. interesting. I also really did like Vic Fangio's realism when he said uh, somebody asked him about uh, if at some point Peyton may have to, you know, relieve you of your duties. And Vic was like, you know, it's the NFL. That's a reality for every single guy in my position. It is what it is. I'm not worrying about that. I'm thinking about the 2021 season and, you know, Hats off to you, Vic, because it could easily be like, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. But he's like, that could happen for sure. Yeah. That's a possible reality. I just I really like the no BS, you know, not everything is sunshine and rainbows and stuffed <laughs> animals that Vic can offer. Sometimes, I mean, there's a time and place, but I'm much more here for the, you know, you don't you don't need to sugar and salt it. Just give me the pure salt. I can take right. it. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. <laughs> All right, well, talking about the quarterbacks, we got Jace Wellner coming in here with their super chat. Besides Andy Dalton, who's your favorite free agent quarterback? 
Ah, my favorite free agent quarterback. Oh man, this is a this is a tough one because it's really not a a good class. And I mean, that's true for free agent quarterbacks almost every single season. Yeah. Uh, it depends on what you want to do. It depends on what you're thinking about Drew Lock right now. Are you looking for a quarterback that can come in and raise the room of the quarterback room where Drew Lock falters and maybe you have that situation where Marcus Mariota, Mariota faltered and then Ryan Tannehill came in? That was a ceiling play. And that yeah. makes me think of somebody like a Jameis Winston. Or is it a floor play where you're saying, but we can't fall back on a Jeff Driscoll, just absolutely terrible offense, but we're not really looking to supplant Drew Lock. And that would be maybe more of a Tyrod Taylor or a Ryan Fitzpatrick, which again, can, can steer the ship yeah. if Drew Locke goes down for a bit, which is a concern at this point after injuries in two seasons. Uh, but, you know, we'll see. And also a lot of it is pairing the guy to potentially options in the draft. You know, like let's say you are looking for uh, Zach Wilson's your guy. You want a quarterback that can maybe mirror Zach Wilson in some ways or pushing the ball vertically. Maybe Ryan Fitzpatrick fits better there. But if you're thinking, you know, we're in the range for – Justin Fields or Trey Lance. Maybe you're looking at Cam Newton or Tyra Taylor, who's somebody who offers a little bit more in the athleticism department. So, right. you know, it's hopefully we're going to hear more as time goes on, but everything's on the table. I do think that most likely barring some outside circumstances, we will see Drew Locke here uh, again next season. But I mean, there, there is a reality out there where they bring in a vet and go get a rookie and say, don't have enough reps for you, Locke. We, you know, good luck elsewhere. It's not fair to you to keep you here at that point and we'll right. trade you for a, uh, third or fourth to like Washington football team or something. Well, And and especially if you, if you use a high pick on a, on a quarterback, you don't want that locker room divided. If drew lock has his best friends there in the locker room and they're kind of going, why are we moving on? We want this guy. You you don't want that kind of controversy showing up. I mean, just look at the line or the uh, lines, excuse me, another bad team, but the dolphins right now, you have these like players in articles unnamed, but saying, you know, like, you know, they were besides themselves upset when they put in Tua because they didn't see the ad lib ability or arm talent to be a good enough quarterback. You know, they wanted Ryan Fitzpatrick. So there was a divide in there with that kind of thing. But, yep. you know, if you don't have your guy at quarterback, this is, this is going to continue to be a thing. You know, they're going to have that stupid quarterback carousel meme or whatever the heck you want to call it graphic until they don't. So we'll see. And we got uh, Muhammad Badri coming in here with the, the pair showing off the glasses and the, the sweatband. That's probably one of my favorites. It's not moving right now, which makes me sad, but uh, Muhammad, we really do appreciate you uh, also always wearing that swag as well. So yeah, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, keep bringing us content, man. We love to talk about what, you, what you lay out in front of us. And then ba- Oh, Oh, uh, Crudum coming in here. What's a realistic trade scenario for Watson with the super chat. Really appreciate that. Um, uh, <laughs> so I mean, it, here's it's how I had it. this never happened this is right what, what do you mean realistic this is like the you know Pangea like I, I don't know the origin of life origin of species yeah. you know it's just like one moment like I don't know what else to base it on we've never seen this right so you have to think of it in the terms of both teams get something good but both teams get hurt in the same process so you, you're looking at at least three first round picks at least You're probably looking at a quality player on a rookie contract. So like a, a, or two. Yeah. Like Draymond Jones kind of Mm -hmm. quality. I'm thinking higher quality. Bradley Chubb possibly. (laughs) Um, So I'm trying to think of some other players that would, would fit that, that idea. Uh, Um, KJ Hamler. KJ Hamler is one for sure. Malik Reed may be able to have some value on return. Uh, you know, what should be selling at a surplus Tim Patrick. Uh, Tim Patrick as well. I mean, honestly, if I'm the Houston Texans and I'm forced to trade with, with anybody, you know, I'm not trading Watson, no matter what, if I was the Houston Texans, I would have not been in the situation, but anyways, we've probably come past that point. I don't think he's going to be back. The issue is goes beyond East should be. It's a McNair issue with Deshaun Watson, the Texans at this point. Uh, but I mean, if I'm the Texans, I'm asking for, obviously I'm getting drew lock back. Cause I need a young quarterback that I can roll with next year, either way. And Drew Locke still has some promise. So that's a lot of ticket. I'll take it. Uh, definitely nine and 40 this year. One, one and two. I'm also asking for Bradley Chubb, a roster builder on a rookie contract. Still one of Jerry Judy or Noah Fant. Uh, your first and third in 2022 and probably a second round pick in 2023. So that's, I mean, that's, that's a hefty load. You're talking yeah. about some good players, but 
you know, I, I think Brad, losing Bradley Chubb would be the one that hurts the most. Uh, I think Broncos country, uh, there's some people who hate Judy and the attitude, which is dumb, but like I was talking to some Broncos fans and they're like, oh, you can't get rid of Jerry Judy. It's like, you know, losing Jerry Judy would suck. No doubt. But you still have Cortland Sutton. You still have Tim Patrick. You still have KJ Hamler. It seems like every single year it's, oh, this is the deepest wide receiver class we've ever seen. Every year that seems to be the narrative. It's becoming like linebacker it, yeah, as far as drag. It's why, it's why I have trouble with the idea of paying wide receivers big time money. Yeah. Because you can find replacement level players for, I don't know, pennies on the dollar, I guess is the best way to say it. I like, I understand. Wide, I wide receiver one, though. Like, I think wide receivers ones, you can still want to use that first round pick and whatnot, but you're using three or four in today's NFL, and good ones can be found yeah. every single year, day two. I mean, if you go back and you just look at the past three years, the wide receivers who have come out of day two, th- yeah. there's a lot of really, really good wide receivers. So if the Broncos had to part with Jerry Judy, you know, it would suck in the moment. I'm sure maybe that's a deal breaker for Deshaun Watson with the no trade clause, but like you have to at least consider it. Yeah. For sure. Ah, so All right. Back to Deshaun Watson. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it costs a lot. We're not sure what they would even be asking. Uh, you got to expect that half the league is going to be calling, if not more, wondering what the price is. And so that's going to drive up the price. Somebody's going to give up a hefty fine. And there's just some teams that have a few more draft capital pieces like the Jets and the Dolphins that have extra first round picks that that can make it work. And he's even said, I'd like to go to Miami. I don't think he said he'd like to go to the Jets yet, but he's liking all the Instagram posts though. Yes. So, um, and he, he has followed a lot of Bronco players and liked some of their stuff as well. So I don't think the Broncos are completely out of the running in that sense. I think it's more realistic than some, some have given it credit to, but uh, I think in the end, somebody else ends up winning that battle against the Broncos. Yeah. So we got a base case coming in here again. Thank you very much. Base case. Uh, does the Okuda pick scare you from taking a cornerback very high? What's the gap between the top two corners and the rest? Uh, I think there is a, this, this cornerback class, I think after the top 40 drops off dramatically, I think the depth is horrible this year at cornerback. So if you need one, you probably need to go one quick. Uh, actually, Buana was in my mentions the other day asking, you know, who are some depth cornerbacks? I've done some work and a lot of these guys are, it's not a good cornerback class at the top. It's right. solid, but it's, you're not going to find guys later on the thing. You'll find very scheme specific guys, but you know, you're talking about a saying Bassies who, you know, he's out there, but uh, you know, you probably, <laughs> you hope you could have somebody better than that. Uh, so, and also I think it's a top three. It's a lot of it comes down to scheme as well. Uh, Patrick Sertan, if you're running a press man scheme or a cover three and you're looking to hit a double instead of a home run, you're probably thinking Patrick Sertan looks pretty good, especially, you know, somebody like, uh, again, I keep coming back to the Cowboys. Trevon Diggs with how good he was this year and the, the scheme that they play. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark, uh, for the Mark Lewis henna. Also always rocking that uh, that old school get up there. Uh, those old timey photos. You ever do that, Carl, with your I did. wife and kids? Those are fun. Well, not, not with my wife and kids. I did it with my, my wife and her family before we had kids. Oh, okay. So you got to do it with the kids. I do someday. You need to see it someday. Yeah. Um, after the, the sick little bug has been tamed a little bit. Uh, but uh, sorry, you flashed that. And I wanted to give a shout out to Marcus there. What, what was our train of thought? We were talking about uh, Okuda and the, and the draft. Oh yes. Cornerback. The depth. top three guys. So Sertan, I mean, cover three press man, not the Broncos scheme, but you know, maybe they'll take a swing at him. He's very safe. He's a double, not a home run kind of guy. Caleb Farley, I think fits really well, but there's massive, bus potential. And then JC Horn, I love the attitude. I mean, you can just, he brings energy and you can see that like, how do you want to overrate swag on the field? You know, that's, that's always something you want to push against because you, you don't want to evaluate, you know, the, the energy they bring per se, but rather their skills. Uh, but I think Horn in the Broncos scheme honestly makes more sense than Sertan. So I would say it's a top three for the Broncos and there's some depth in the top 50. Okay, but after got, that, the, got the Georgia guys. Yep. Taysom Campbell, Eric Stokes is really good as well. Uh, but I just think it drops off. I mean, Deion Kendricks was somebody I was interested in. He left. So uh, there's a, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. There's a UCF cornerback who's a redshirt senior. So he's a little bit older, but he's hung out. He's hung with guys running four threes down the seam and has pretty good ball skills. I think it was the number one Juco transfer as well. His name is Aaron something, Aaron Robinson, I want to say, uh, but he's one that interests me, but that's about it as far as a depth guy so far in my process. And then, so, yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm with you. It's not not my favorite cornerback draft. It's probably why, honestly, I'd lean cornerback before 
before edge rusher. Just it's because a good edge class. It is. That is the thing is that there's a lot of guys I like in the second, third, third round of this draft that I think could be even day one impact players. Yeah. Uh, somebody else I do like is uh, Greg Newsom from Northwestern. Uh, but he's been rising up before I was like, Oh, you can get him day three. And now it seems like he's pushing the top 50, but that's probably also because the cornerback class is <laughs> not very good. So yep. we'll see. Um, Kenneth Booker coming in. Uh, what NFL coach would you hate to play for? Um, you know what? I am, have never been the best at following strict directions. So while there is a lot of credit to Bill Belichick, I would probably have a lot of eye rolls and be doing a lot of sprints and whatnot with Bill <laughs> Belichick. Uh, it's, it's just, he's not my, he's not my cup of tea. And I, you know, everybody, oh, the subway commercial. I get that. Uh, that one made me laugh. But I just every day, I think that would be. I want to go somewhere where it's fun to go to work. And once Tom Brady left, it did not look super fun there anymore. Yeah, so, uh, I would say Bill Belichick. <laughs> I would have said Adam Gase before he got fired. Where's the base Gase? For I know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just because, I mean, he is kind of an egomaniac. At least with Belichick, there, there's history of going. Okay, this is proven that this works and is winning and all those kind of things. Gase has that attitude without the winning. Yeah. And uh, so th- that would be a guy that I'd struggle with. Uh, I'm trying to think all the guys kind of got fired this year, Bill O'Brien. So yeah, it kind of leaves Bill Belichick. Um, I don't know. Could you play for Chucky? Uh, I probably could. He yeah. would be fun to come. I mean, he's just, he's a weirdo, but yeah. I think it would be fun to go work with him. Um, yeah, that's, I don't know. That's a good question. I Bill Belichick though. Ugh, not, yeah. not my favorite. We yeah. got Joshua love, coming in here. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say on the other, other end of that, I'd love to go sit, play for uh, Steve Carell. Yes. I don't The clapping and the junk, gum chewing. I get enough of that with my Kirk Ferentz and the Hawkeyes every week. So maybe, <laughs> maybe no thanks to that, but I, I am already in Seattle. So yeah. Hey, yeah, I made a tackle once in high school. No, <laughs> um, so we got Kenneth Booker coming in. I would go De Niro with Gase. Are you talking to me? Oh, I got it. I was like, to <laughs> play him in a movie? Uh, Wade Phillips would be my favorite. Wade Phillips would be a very good one as well. I, I would love to work um, McDermott. I really think McDermott is a heck of a coach. And mm-hmm. uh, he's also one, if you were ever doing like a battle royale with all the coaches, he's picked number one. That dude yeah. has pecs for days. <laughs> he's uh, a monster. I'm thinking uh, – Tennessee's coach. Why am I like Rabel. Yeah. yeah. There's probably one A and one B. I, I stood next to Rabel. It was, I mean, it was the whole, my neck was hurting from looking up and the guy was, I mean, he looked like he could still play for another 10 years in the NFL. Yeah. Ah, oh, man. He's a, he's a dude. Um, we got Joshua coming here. Joshua, always appreciate you seeing you on uh, Facebook and Twitter as well. I think um, with our first pick, do you go coverage best linebacker or cornerback or a whole different position? I mean, it really depends on how the board falls. You know, maybe there's somebody who is infatuated with the speed Jalen Waddle brings and you think they can't get that later, so they want to trade up. Maybe somebody's infatuated with Trey Lance and they go up and get him or they think after the all four of the big quarterbacks are off the board and after Mac Jones, there's a massive fall off. Maybe somebody wants to come up. Uh, right now, though, I think I would have Fairley and Parsons as the non-quarterbacks you're hoping for, but I, I wrote an article this week. This is such a weird draft because all these top guys didn't play. So there's just so much more risk. And then you don't have the medicals and the uh, combine where all the metrics are standardized because everybody's running the same field with the same timing and whatnot. So that's I, you're going to see a wild draft this year. There's going right. to be, and there's going to be more bust than usual, but there'll be more late round hits than usual. So hopefully right. the Broncos got the right guys in place because this could be a, a big season for setting the momentum of for this franchise going forward. And they need it with how they are in the AFC West right now. And I got to love base case. Come on, Carl Payton told me otherwise. (laughs) It's like, I I bet that's like the top heading of his, of his uh, resume. I coached Peyton Manning to an MVP season. (laughs) I mean, you can't blame him for that one. You got to go with that. (laughs) Yeah. Um, We got crew dam coming on crew dam. Coming in twice today. We appreciate you. See, see you uh, rocking there. Uh, thank you very much. Hopefully we see you continuing going forward here. Um, if we moved on from Vaughn, is edge rusher one or two priority? I mean, it has to be. And something that uh, stood out to me also with uh, Peyton, and I feel like he, Woody Page asked him a question, but it felt like it was a little unprompted. He talked about his kind of just philosophies, and he said, building on the trenches. If you can hang in the offensive line and the defensive line, you got a chance every week. And I think he probably knows that pretty well with watching the Vikings this year. You know, everybody loves to poop on Kirk Cousins. 
Kirk Cousins was phenomenal this year. He was actually really good. Vikings defensive line was one of the worst I'd seen in a few seasons. Now, granted, they had injuries. Uh, when you lose a guy like uh, Daniel Hunter, who's one of the best edge rushers in football, Michael Pierce opts out, and you're hurting. But mm-hmm. I think he's really going to think that depth on the defensive line and the offensive line is going to be important. So edge rusher would be up there. I don't know if there is an edge that makes sense at nine overall in this class uh, without it being a reach. I mean, Gregory Russo without the combine. Uh, I know he had six sacks last year, but they're raw. I don't yeah, know. One, it, it's so weird. Like most drafts, you have your top edge guy, your Chase Young. Yeah. You know, Khalil Mack, those Miles kind of guys. Garrett. Miles Garrett, that you just know Nick this Bo- is a guy that's going top five. This year, you got a bunch of guys that are bunched together, partly because some of them opted out. So you didn't get to see that growth potential. Like they showed potential two seasons ago, but were they going to continue down that trend? And then you got a lot of guys who put up decent numbers, but it wasn't anything that just blew the page off this year. And so you just got a lot of them bunched together. Uh, And it's kind of a, a, you know, it's your, your flavor. flavor. Yeah. And uh, yeah, (laughs) we've been hanging out too much. Echo chambers, baby. Yeah. But uh, (laughs) but it's true. I mean, I think, what was it? We were talking on our uh, our group chat that we have for some of the mile high huddle stuff of who we like as our top pass rusher. I think we had four or five different names pop up as the the guy that we liked the most. And so even there, you, it just kind of depends what you're watching, what you like, and and what fits your system. Yeah, I mean it's a, it's a really deep edge class this year, so we'll see how it fits. I do think the Broncos. I really am a part of the philosophy where you want a guy who's more of a pocket pusher at the edge at one side, and then you want a speed guy at the other side. I think two speed guys, you know, that makes you a little bit leaky on the edges. And especially with quarterbacks who can break the pocket, like a Herbert, like a Mahomes, you want to have a little bit more of integrity with the pocket while you're getting pass rush. So they have that guy who's more of a power player in Chubbs. You're looking for somebody who can do a little bit more of the finesse, bend stuff and play in space. So guys that come to mind for me, Micah Parsons, which there's some projection there because he played off ball, but he came in as an edge. He played running back in high school. Uh, I think you probably move him around to a little bit of both, but I think there's definitely reps for him as a a Sam in that a, a four three over uh, that kind of look. And then you got guys like Joseph Asai and Aziz Ojolari and Ronnie Perkins, who I also like a lot. That can fit that mold as well as being kind of a a stand up edge who can then drop off into zones, whether they play in the flat or the hook zone or whatever. So uh, those are the guys that I'm looking for scheme wise, specifically for the Broncos. Yeah, I we we just had the question a little bit earlier of of Micah Parsons and our thoughts of him being taken at nine. I I like it for the most part. I just you got to have a plan of how you're going to use him because he he's kind of a, a tweener where he's not quite an edge guy, but he's not quite an off ball guy, and, and so you got to know how you're going to use him in the system. Is he going to be the guy that's coming from the off-ball linebacker position? A lot of rushes where you send one of the edge guys back in coverage and have him come on the blitz in the middle. I mean, it's not really a blitz, but but pressure up the middle. Uh, are you going to have him playing some off the edge? What, what, I mean, you can move him around, which is a great chess piece. But he's not in the NFL, horrible in drop zones. He's not horrible in drop zones. Not, no, he's not horrible. I'm just saying it's not – coverage is not his strength right now because he wasn't asked to do it a whole lot in, at Penn State. it's He's still new to the position. He's still learning. I mean, he, he's raw, but he's one of the most athletic freaks of the entire draft. And so, again, you're, you're kind of hoping that this guy can reach his full potential. But you, you just you like to see a little bit more of a finished product for a guy that you're picking top 10. So that there's there's some concerns there. Yeah, my, my concerns, obviously there's the rawness to his game. His ticker's a little slow, but he was brand new to the position, so that's to be expected. Uh, it's that on top of the – sorry, my cat just busted in here. Um, the It's that on top of the character concerns. There is smoke surrounding Micah Parsons, the person. So obviously that'll be vetted out. Hopefully you hope your front office can know about the person. But, I mean, you can have all the tools in the world, but if you're not you know, putting in the work, if you're lazy or entitled – or just a bad person, probably not going to work out for you. And I've definitely fallen trapped to that, mostly with defensive linemen. Uh, Malik McDowell, freak, absolute freak. You know, $100, $100 athlete, five-cent head, out of the league in like two yeah. years. I mean, whatever. Robert Camdichi is another one. You know, number one overall recruit, amazing tools, uh, guy who had top 10 talent, idiot, out of the league. Right. So it's it's uh, it's an issue. Um, yeah. John Boy, I don't think Rasu, I can't ever Rosso is an edge. I think he's bulk up so, and similar to DeForest Buckner. 
Uh, I definitely think that's possible. You want guys who are multiple. I think Rosso Rosso is going to be multiple. You're going to play him at some seven. You're going to play him at some nine. You're going to play him at some five. Uh, maybe bulk up and be a Buckner. I just don't. I think he's a little tall. And I think that would be an issue for him with the leverage, especially with interior offensive linemen. I'm looking at more of somebody with a little bit more inside outside ability and somebody such as uh, Clayus Campbell, I think is the ceiling projection that you're looking for there. Both right. Miami guys. Maybe that's the easy connection for a huge edge rusher, but right. that's the one I'm thinking of. I know he, you sold me on one guy, Mr. Quitty. Mm-hmm. I do like, yeah. you know, honestly, uh, and I think it was uh, his, he goes by JR drafts on Twitter, uh, go back and forth a few times. Good follow a uh, good Bronco Bronco follow as well. Um, him and I have been going back and forth and a guy that really intrigues me. He's got injuries, 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 but he's the former number one overall recruit in the country and transferred from UCLA to Miami. And that's Jalen Phillips. That kid has got some moves really, yeah. in, really enticing injuries, concussions, uh, might be there day two and he might like his tape might be edge one in the class. So, you know, that's the thing that this, this draft is really weird, especially with edge. Rush. Oh, oh, this is, this is throwdown language right here. Oh, Charlie no. Beagle edge rusher is getting to be as overrated as Nick thinks running backs are. But it, it, let's put it up against the, uh, the money that's given to him. <laughs> money talks here. Money talks. Oh man. I, uh, I need more than that. I need That's, that's a, that's just a statement without anything back in it. So we'll have to, we'll have to flush that out on Twitter a little bit. Um, we got Isaac Mitchell coming in here. Thanks for making Twitter fun again. Didn't use since 2015. Isaac, welcome to the addiction. That is the bird app. Uh, God rest your soul. God rest your relationships. God rest your work. And uh, we look forward to seeing there. You fellow degenerate, <laughs> but really, I mean, God, Twitter's addicting. Um, we got John boy coming in here too. Uh, the buzz for Rashawn Slater is building each week. Since he is bought into him that much, Sewell is still available. You trading up for him, or does he switch him? Be switch uh, bolts to right tackle. Um, Rashawn Slater, there is enough buzz that he might actually be the first offensive lineman off the board. Uh, Sewell has some questions uh, from the pass blocking sets to, especially his feet. I mean, he's just he's he's huge, but sometimes you're giving up a little bit of athleticism to do that, and he's great in space almost more like a guard though, than an, than a tackle as far as the athleticism in space goes. Uh, but still, I think Sewell will go top seven, top eight. And uh, I'm not trading up in the first round for anything but a quarterback because the cost is just too high and you don't yep. get enough. You won't get enough return on investment to be worth it. If you're trading up in the first, in the top 10, first round, back into the first round, we can talk value positions, getting that fifth year uh, option, you know, tackle cornerback edge rusher, Top 10, though, it better be a quarterback. Right. It's either that or a guy at a premium position like edge rusher that you think is going to be the biggest star in the league. But then everybody's trying to get that guy in the top five anyway. So the value begins to to rise up even more, kind of like Chase Young last year. Uh, It it just You're right. Quarterback's about the only position that's really worth putting the extra capital in to go get because it just – even an average quarterback on a rookie contract can do pretty good things roster wise. Now, AFC, that's a little bit tougher now just because you got so many young quarterbacks that I don't think even average makes it anymore. You, you got to be good to great to really compete because you still got a lot of guys like Herbert. Um, Allen's still on a rookie contract. Mayfield's on a rookie contract. I'm trying to think of who else. Burrow's going to be on a rookie contract. So you got a lot of guys who are still there who are, are good to great quarterbacks. Uh, so again, that, that's the only position that's worth going up and getting at this point. I agree with you. That's probably what it's going to be, unfortunately. So, I mean, you know, we'll see what happens yeah. though. Anything can happen. You know, when you talk in absolutes, a lot of times, especially when it comes to the draft, you make yourself look like an idiot and then you end up on old takes exposed. Right. And, 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 I, do, there. and I do just want to say you don't move bulls from left tackle. I don't no. care who else you bring in. Bowles is great at left tackle. Don't don't put an extra question mark on the season when you've already got a for sure thing of a great left tackle. Yeah, I agree with you. And also, you're t- totally changing the technique. I know it's kind of yep. a an offensive line coach cliche, but the, I I heard it when I was playing OL, and they said you got to uh, switching from left to right tackle is like switching the ha- predominant hand you use when you wipe your behind. You know, it, it just does not feel natural flipping to the other side. So uh, yeah. it's not super easy. Um, yeah. We got one here from Black Knight. Should we try to get Najee Harris in the second round? 
I don't think he'll be there in the second round. First off, he might be, but I think it'll be before the Broncos pick. Uh, I'm not against taking a running back in the top 50 ever, unless you feel like you're a running back away from a Super Bowl, which the Broncos are not. Uh, so, I mean, if he's there, given Peyton's history, I think it's possible. Also with how the contract's set up with Lindsey and Gordon, I think it's possible. Uh, but I'm much more of a take a guy every every year, every other year, uh, round five on, and then call it good. And eventually you're going to hit because that's just, that's the position. Yep. We got Big E Bronco coming in here. I like the kid from Notre Dame for inside linebacker. Uh, we've talked about him quite a bit because you did an article on him. Just, yeah. He's kind of a he's kind of one of those hybrid players that not quite the size you like for a true inside linebacker, and not quite not quite the the safety prospect. So he's kind of that hybrid. You're going to have to move him around. You're going to have to again another player. You're going to have to know how you're going to use him because you can't have him as a hey stick this guy in the middle and good things are going to happen because you're going to see him get wiped out on some plays. Uh, it's kind of like uh, who who was it the Shoot, the linebacker the Broncos brought in like three days. No, Mark Barron. Mark Barron. No. Uh, Yeah, let me finish here. Uh, For the (laughs) – um, they brought him in right before the season started because their linebackers got hurt, and he played week one and was downright terrible. They they drafted him, then he went off somewhere else, then he came back. Nelson. Oh, Corey Nelson. You're talking yes. about a couple years ago. Okay. Yes. Yes. Sorry. A couple years ago. But w- when you're looking at that kind of size, he, I mean, he's good enough speed wise to kind of get around the edge, but you're still going to have plays, especially when they're doing those power goal line plays. He is not going to be the guy you want there in the middle. I just, I know they brought in Mark Barron this year and some, you could say, oh, if they liked Mark Barron enough, then they'd use a pick on JOK. But you're talking about a very cheap one year contract for a sub package kind of guy versus the number nine overall pick, which needs to be a building block. And I do like JOK. I don't know if I like him in the scheme. I Fangio asks his stack linebackers. That would be Alexander Johnson and Josie Jewell to play in the muck a lot. They have a lot of responsibility coming downhill and taking on offensive linemen. And I just, that's not JOK's game. I don't think he would be, absolutely horrible there, but it's going to be an issue. And honestly, when I see this defense, I think he would probably project more as a Will Parks kind of mold where Will Parks played in a three, three, five, I believe a three, three, five at the Wildcats. And he was that like safety in the box type. And that's what JOK is. I, I much, much, much prefer him in a base four, three defense that runs a cover three scheme because you can have him be a will play a little bit over the slot, over the hash marks would use that athleticism there, which he can do. He's got great processing to him and that athleticism pops. Uh, but I, I, this defense, I just don't see it. And then in a cover three, more so coverage rather than the match quarters the Broncos use, uh, then you will see uh, him play more of a robber role where I think he's the best. So he's great. Scheme fit is so important, guys. I mean, it's just, it's not a guy in a vacuum. It has to, they have to match what you do. And I just don't know exactly if he does what the Broncos would value him to do at the linebacker position. And does he play enough uh, deep safety to be a safety in this position, in this scheme? Right. I don't know. I, I, I lean no, but we'll see. Right. Uh, all right. Real, real quick, we wanted to let you guys know, uh, it really does help us help us out a lot. If you go to iTunes, uh, YouTube, all over, where, wherever you can share our stuff, or if you can leave a comment and, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a five-star review. If you don't think we're five-star, let us know. But we really do appreciate the five-star reviews and uh, just letting us know what's all going on. Um, and hopefully we get that person to listen to us as well, not just Chad and Zach. But, yeah, we got a couple here, though. We, I, yeah, I, we do. I said we were going to read them, so let's pull them up. Let's read them. First, we got this one here. Um, we're going to read them both, though, because if you guys do them, I think we should read them because you definitely yeah. deserve it. Um, Huddle Up with the MHH crew uh, from Cal L. Jenkins. Thank you very much, Cal L. Uh, these awesome individuals pour their heart and soul into every Bronco – Everything Broncos related, not only am I kept up to date with the current state of the Broncos, Broncos country, but also get to see and hear them with this channel and their wonderful, knowledgeable MHH show on YouTube. Keep up the great work, fellows, and Bronco on. That means a lot, Cal L, uh, whoever that is out there. Jay, Um, I told you we'd read it. And also there's another one too, John. Would you pull that one up as well? I know that um, it does not specifically highlight us, but I definitely think they deserve a shout out and we should do it. I love the show from CAF 84. I only listen to Chad and Zach mistakes. Um, no, I'm just, uh, you guys should definitely 
you, know, you don't want to live in an echo chamber. Our shows all have different flavors and obviously everybody has a different flavor p- preference, but uh, you know, um, hopefully we can get this listener on here as well, but I only listen to Chad and Zach, but if you're a true Broncos fan, it's a must listen. I love the show. Getting to talk and listen to other Broncos fans is fun, whether they win or lose. And that's very true as well. I mean, the community is the best thing about this. There's no doubt about it. And uh, they do a great job going over all the Broncos news and it's a great year long podcast, seven days a week, folks. And I, I can't, I don't think there's another show that does that. So we appreciate it. And, uh, you guys definitely hope oh, that <laughs> that guy need to get listening to Zach and Carl the best. Well, okay. And Kenneth Booker saying a uh, six star. Uh, yeah, Ooh. very much. So we really appreciate you guys. And if you, again, I'm trolling for those. So if you guys leave a comment, we'll read it on here. You know, you don't, you don't have to super chat or whatever it's, we're going to come up and we're going to say thank you because if you do that for us, you deserve a thank you. Yes. It's um, so uh, thank you very much, Thomas. We appreciate it. And I think there was one more, Super chat in here that we should get to before we get on out. Um, Go ahead. Uh, Yes. Is there a poor man's Parsons in the draft? I do actually have a a poor man's Parsons in mind. Uh, Carl, can you guess who it is? I'm trying to think. Nick Bolton's a big time hitter. Yeah, but he's small. Yeah. I'm just trying to think of guys that are like big time explosive hit. Love to, to hit. I, Questionable yeah. processing, big, huge athlete, Baron Browning, Ohio State. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, he, he had some – there's some questions there about his uh, mental processing, but there are with Parsons as well. And Browning, like, he's huge and he can fly. So, you know, that's a – I am I would like him a lot. I'm, I'm definitely – Cameron McGrone, round two. He's the guy that I'm interested in. Uh, if I could pick one right now, watching his tape, especially his fresh retro freshman year tape, uh, because he was injured this past year in Michigan and played, like, a weird schedule, like four or five games because of the sick little bug, but Cameron McGrown, love him. Baron yeah. Browning though. Hey, that's the, that's the uh, knockoff one. And where do you guys write the views? It's on iTunes. Uh, I think there's also some on Spotify, but I'm an, I'm an Apple user guys. I know oh, well, basic, yeah. whatever. I also got my somewhere. I got my, uh, my smart water, water bottle too. I guess somebody who's all basic like that is called a Visco girl. No idea what it means, but uh, <laughs> I'll own it. Um, so that's me, a Visco yeah. girl. And Using my I did want to, I did want to give a quick shout out to to Poppy. I got my my stuff, my swag, my swag. Um, yes. Got my cup here with my my handy dandy coffee and my calendar sitting here and blankets at home. Told my daughter that uh, yeah, got mine here. Oh, boom! That's the wrong way. There you go. Yeah, thank you so much. It's I'm keeping it on my desk here and uh, it's really helping me every single day. Know know what day it is when I'm on the podcast. It's on my. Yes on my station here for work (laughs) but yes really appreciate that really appreciate all of you coming in here getting to talk some football always the fastest hour of my week for sure and uh, nick always good to see your your wonderful face yeah thank you guys so much and we gotta obviously read on out of here but again highlight to you guys we really do appreciate you and you know we may have differing opinions that's fine we need to have a platform where you can come with somebody and have an open exchange of ideas and it doesn't turn into ad hominem attacks or belittling each other you know if i disagree i'm going to tell you i'm not going to sugarcoat it but that's fine that's how we all learn and grow and there's going to be times that we're wrong there are times that you guys are wrong so there's going to be times that we're right and you're right you know it's that's just that's the beauty of football especially with a draft you know best guys in the business mess up all the time i mean for Christ's sake, Jamarcus Russell went number one overall. Tom Brady fell to the sixth round. You know, it's just, there's a human element that you'll never get. So shoot your shot, folks. And you're going to miss some, but, you know, Kobe. That's that's all I got to say there. Hashtag Kobe. Um, That's going to do it today for Building the Broncos, though. Uh, Happy Tuesday. Thank you guys very much for joining us. You guys can find Carl on Twitter, at Carl Dummler, MHH, and myself, at Nick Kendall, MHH. Guys, go over to milehighhuddle.com for all of our written content. I have had a few articles already covering the draft that have been released this month. Uh, Carl, I know you had the Dane Brugler one recently. Obviously, guys, go check that out. Uh, so, well, obviously, draft season's here, off season's here, new general manager. There's going to be things to talk about, and we're going to be here for that. Also, like we already talked about earlier, go to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating and a comment. If you do so, I'm going to pull it up and put it out here as long as it's the PG-13. We'll, we'll call it PG-13. Um, like subscribe and share. If you are joining us on YouTube, uh, click those thumbs up. If you're joining us on Facebook, that can do a lot to help us and helps, helps us continue to bring you these shows, not just our show, not just building the Broncos, but also the Dove Valley deep divers, mile high insiders, and the show is Zach and Chad, the huddle up podcast. Follow us on Twitter at huddle, mile high huddle and at BTB football pod. Oh, we got Muhammad Badri coming in one more time with the super sticker. We appreciate you very much uh, for coming in here again. It's always good to see you, Muhammad. 
Um, and also Jay said uh, he loves us. So that is PG 13 Jay. I'll give you another shout out. Um, but man, we appreciate the heck out of you guys. Uh, you know what, Carl, we got one more in here. Do you have time? Do you have yeah, time? I've got time. This is something that I feel like we need to have a, a front against a narrative. Okay. And Marcus Page, we appreciate you with this comment here. I think that there is a misunderstanding of basic perception versus the reality that I perceive for the Broncos offensive line. Yeah. So Carl, uh, when the heck will the Broncos build the O line? It's awful. Okay. So one, I think they've already began that process big time. You think about this next year, they're going to have four returning starters for sure with Juwan James, who is a starter who kind of opted out would have been a starter with this group. You've got the same offensive line coach that'll now have been there for three years in Mike Munchak. And if you look at his history, year three is always the time that, that things go crazy. I mean, it, the, the, with the, the Steelers, that's when they started playing great. You saw the Steelers this year, how much they stunk on the offensive line because they're, you're seeing without Munchak there coaching them up, they're, they're just going downhill in a hurry. Now, I would say also you have to look at the Broncos offensive line in two different areas of one. They've got Reisner at left guard, Cushenberry at center, had kind of a rotation there at right guard just because of injuries. Uh, so that, that middle core was always kind of in flux. And your center is supposed to be kind of your leader. Well, when he's still learning the offense, learning how to function in the NFL, that, that's a tough place to be. They were terrible at the beginning of the year. They got much, much better as the season progressed. You love that you saw the the growth by Garrett Bowles. I expect to see some of that same growth from Dalton Reisner, Lloyd Cushenberry, uh, even Graham Gla- Glas- Glasgow this year. Uh, Juwan James will kind of see how that plays out. But uh, but for the most part, yes, I think if you look at how the offensive line ended the season, they were playing like a top 15 unit, and I think they could even be this a top 10 unit this upcoming season. Yeah, offensive line is much more about the – overall effect of the unit rather than one singular guy. So while people Garrett Bowles became a very popular whipping boy, uh, that wasn't really the end all be all uh, for the offensive line struggles. And this season you saw them progress. I mean, Lloyd Cushenberry was just named pro football writers of America, all rookie team for center. And he struggled to start the year, no doubt about it, uh, but he progressed. And, you know, people think back to Matt Paradis, Connor McGovern, those guys were on the practice squad, their rookie season. They didn't even see the active roster. So to see Cushenberry get that experience and grow, I think can only be a benefit. You saw Reisner start to write the ship. I think Glasgow, while he wasn't a, you know, a big, huge putting the team over the top offensive line signing, he did bring some stability and he still has that versatility. Moody flashed some, there's some hope there. Pass work needs a lot of work. Um, and Gear Bulls just got a huge contract. So that right tackle position, I'm with you guys. And honest to God, if the Broncos traded back in the first round, or they want to trade back up in the first round and take a right tackle, even though they already have paying Joan James, Great. You know, I, that's a value position. I have no issue with that. But to say that the Broncos have not been building the offensive line or to say that this offensive line is the reason that the offense is continually in the bottom five, I just think is is unfair. Right. That's, not, that's not what I see. I think it's it's an offensive line that easily is top half of the league right, right. now. And that's, again, the Broncos offensive line incredible. No, that's more about how bad a lot of offensive lines are across the league. Right. And I think the floor is like 15 going into next year. You're talking about a line that could be top five. I right. really think they could be top five next year. Right. And, and it's one of those, I, I'd say there's maybe five great offensive lines in the NFL and about 27 average to downright terrible offensive lines in football. It, it's just one of those groups. It One, it's hard to keep them together. Once you get a good unit, it's hard to keep them healthy, keep them all working as a unit, because like you said, it takes all five to really make a good unit. You, you got one weak link. You, Honest to God. Yeah, seven. really, it does. Um, got to have a great offensive line coach with the Broncos doing one check. It, it just, there, there's a lot of things that have to go right for a great offensive line to happen. And it can go downhill very quickly, but, uh, yeah. but otherwise you got to have just a good enough offensive line. I mean, the chiefs don't have a great offensive line, They've got bad. a bottom 10 They're offensive end of football. Uh, the, the Packers, the Packers are there. Yeah. So it, it just, you got to look at it that way of you try to put as much as you can, but you can, you don't want to put too much into the unit either because then it's at the expense of everything else on the roster. 
And I think the Broncos have put a lot into the offensive line. First round pick, pick Garrett Bowles. Second round pick, Dalton Reisner. Third round pick, Lloyd Cushenberry. Big money at right guard. Big money at right tackle. And so that they've put a lot into the unit. It's just, it, you got to give it some time to fully come together. Yeah, and I know it's kind of maybe cliche because we're coming off of them getting beat right now, but uh, you can invest in a very good offensive line, and that does not mean that they're going to be great. I mean, at one point, the Browns, who they were you know, terrible for years and years and years and years, they had Joe Thomas, Alex Mack, and Mitchell Schwartz, and Joel Batino, all yep. on that offensive line. You're talking about four guys who are Pro Bowl or better. Right. And, and, this, and, and this, what else plays into it? Running backs actually hitting the right hole. Quarterback helping the offensive line, not hurting. So th- th- there's so much that plays into how good or bad an offensive line will look. And unfortunately for the Broncos, they haven't they haven't looked good on the offensive line, but they've had a lot of reasons of why that's happened. But I think they're heading in the right direction big time that th- you're going to have a lot of people talking about this unit next year. Yeah, I agree with you. And one last thing before we get on out of here, here's something that maybe seems a little bit of a juxtaposition. I think that the Broncos off the Broncos offense would obviously look better with Deshaun Watson. Offensive line might look worse. Say what you will about Drew Locke. He gets rid of the ball. He gets hit, but he doesn't take sacks. Deshaun Watson is greedy in the pocket. Now that comes with explosive plays down the field and like throws that just don't make sense and playmaking ability that Drew Locke doesn't have. I mean, Drew Locke's not, not a playmaker, but it's not Deshaun Watson playmaker. But the offensive line, I think, would look worse with Watson than it would with Drew Locke. So interesting thing to talk about. Doesn't mean the offense would be worse because we're talking about Deshaun Franklin Watson. But still, thank you guys so much. We appreciate you. Uh, as always, like to say, go Broncos. And also one of my favorite ones, I'm going to probably use this one until we're out of this window. But uh, stay positive, but test negative. Love y'all. You've been listening to Building the Broncos. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.